really uh, honored to be here. Uh, first time at AnacondaCon uh, and in Austin, so really happy about that. Um, my name is uh, Nick Pentreath. I'm ML Nick on Twitter and GitHub. I'm a principal engineer at IBM, where I work for the Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies, or CODE. I focus on machine learning and AI. Uh, I spend a lot of time working in the Apache Spark community, where I'm a committer and PMC member on that project, um, and wrote a book, fairly out of date now, Machine Learning with Spark. Uh, and I talk at conferences and meetups and other events around the world on uh, topics related to machine learning and AI. Uh, so a little bit about CODE. Uh, Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies um, is a relaunch of a team within IBM uh, that was known as the Spark Technology Center. Uh, so when I joined, it was called STC, uh, and it was formed to, uh, to really focus on the Apache Spark uh, project and the surrounding ecosystem. Um, and since then, it's really expanded uh, the focus to be, uh, to be looking at the full enterprise AI lifecycle in open source. Uh, so that's heavily focused on the Python data science stack, uh, still a little bit of Spark, but more recently, uh, deep learning uh, and the various deep learning frameworks. Um, and a few of the uh, open source projects that we curate, uh, which I'll be talking about today. So we're, we're around 36 open source developers fully committed to, uh, to developing and contributing to open source projects um, and creating content around all of that. So any talk about uh, AI and AI pipelines um, must start with a little bit about uh, questioning about what is AI. Um, you know, it, it's a hot topic at the moment. And everyone uh, out there, and especially the media, uh, has this concept of um, artificial general intelligence uh, you know, that can either wipe out humanity uh, or lift us up you know, in, into a higher state. But you know, we as practitioners understand that the reality is very different from this. Um, and when, when most people talk about AI, what they're really talking about is machine learning and more recently deep learning. You know, so what is that? Uh, so simply, it's learning from data to make predictions. And if you want to drill down a little bit, um, typically learning from historical data to make predictions about the future. And applied machine learning is learning from historical data to make predictions about the future for a specific reason, and that's to make decisions. And most of what we refer to, or what is known as AI today, is really uh, an intelligent system or an interlinking linking of intelligent systems of which you know, machine learning and deep learning models play a significant role. So an intelligent system takes that one step further. It's, uh, it's about automated decision making, continually learning from new data and feedback um, and adapting to the environment and memory and generalization. Um, and we've seen applications of, uh, you know, this is what I'll refer to as AI, and we've seen that in in everything from uh, online uh, video games uh, through to self-driving cars, traffic systems, uh, you know, intelligent farming and, and industry, healthcare, online advertising, uh, recommendation engines, you name it. Uh, increasingly, every, uh, pretty much every field has been uh, impacted and, um, uh, and has an application of AI. So because of this prevalence, I mean, that, and that's only growing, we really need to ask the question, um, can we trust these systems? They're increasingly making uh, you know, business critical um, and life critical decisions in an automated fashion. So we need to be able to trust the, those systems. Um, and trusted AI is built on these four pillars, openness, transparency, security, fairness. So why open? Well, uh, most of these algorithms and the, the, the technologies underpinning them um, are becoming increasingly commoditized um, and, and open sourced. Uh, so that's le led to a huge advance in these technologies and in these algorithms. Um, but openness is, is also important because we want to be able to uh, dive into that code, these models, the, the, the algorithms themselves, and understand that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Are, are they correct? Are they correctly implemented? Transparency uh, is about uh, being uh, open and, and clear ab about what are the uh, limitations of models. Uh, what are the metrics and you know, accuracy performance metrics uh, and the numbers around that? Um, and related to, you know, to what we'll talk about a bit later, bias and fairness, you know, wh what, are the, what are the metrics, uh, not just uh, as a whole, but across all the different, uh, you know, different subpopulations that may be impacted? Uh, so these, these technologies have to be fair. You know, they, they have to make decisions in a, in a fair and, and objective manner. 
um, and, and try to mitigate some of the biases that might come in from, from, uh, from data sets or from the models themselves. Um, and, so, and they have to be secure. They have to be secure against, um, against malicious attacks uh, and against inadvertent attacks. So those are some of the pillars that we, we need to address. Um, so we'll take a step back and just talk about the machine learning workflow and, and pipelines and how, um, how we can implement that uh, with open technologies. Um, and then come back to some of these aspects about transparency, security, fairness. So the machine learning workflow, as you all know, uh, is simple. You start with data, you apply machine learning, uh, and you profit, right? But in reality, it's a lot more complex. And uh, this is the, the, the machine learning workflow that we all know and love. Um, and it, it spans teams from our data engineers who are dealing with uh, data curation and, and management through to our data science and research teams who are uh, working on that data science sub-workflow of actually ingesting that data, uh, looking at data visualization and exploration, you know, uh, feature extraction, transformation engineering, getting data into a format that's ready for model training, uh, and then performing that model selection and evaluation step. Um, and then finally, once they've got a model, deploying that. Um, and that that sort of uh, jumps over the, the team boundary into your machine learning and production engineers. So there you've got to worry about uh, deploying um, pipelines, which we'll talk about, uh, you know, model versioning. Once it's in the live system, it has to you know, predict you know, given new data, but it, you have to monitor that carefully um, and evaluate whether that model is performing. Um, and then there's that feed, feedback loop. Uh, typically, most systems, um, especially kind of user-facing or end-user-facing systems, are going to be impacting the, their own training data in some way. They're going to be uh, ha having a feedback loop of data which gets fed back both into your data stores and your models. Uh, and that workflow not only spans teams, but also tools. Uh, so there's a wide variety of common data formats that have to be handled. Um, a wide variety of uh, languages and frameworks for uh, dealing with uh, pipelines and machine learning, cross-validation. Um, at each step, there's a wide pl plethora of, uh, of different tools, different languages, different frameworks um, that all have to be supported because in any reasonably large or medium to large size team, uh, you're gonna hit uh, and use pretty much all of these. You know, and finally, though it's important, this machine learning uh, deep learning piece is a really small piece of that puzzle. Uh, so I really like this, this uh, you know, image from the hidden technical debt in machine learning systems, you know, which shows that really this code, this ML code, is a small piece of this overall puzzle, and it really has to, um, has to interface very, uh, you know, a lot with all the other uh, pieces, you know, feature extraction, serving infra infrastructure and analysis tools, monitoring, which we'll be talking about today. So moving on to the, the training phase of that workflow, um, just as you know, if you go to the gym or you're training uh, your body in some way, doing some exercise, there's uh, there the are a whole uh, number of different ways um, of doing that, different exercises, different approaches, uh, different sports. Um, and in the same way, in, in machine learning and deep learning, we've seen this explosion of different frameworks. You know, and so these are just some of them. Um, and each way has uh, each each framework and, and toolkit has its own way of of handling. Um, you know, model evaluation, pipelines, input data, serialization formats, distributed training, uh, GPUs, and so on. Um, and again, it's not enough to support one of these. Uh, data science teams and researchers and machine learning engineers are typically gonna be using um, almost all of them, or at least uh, a significant subset of them. Everyone's got their favorite toolkit, um, and they all have to be supported. So to deal with this, uh, one of the projects that we have, that we are curating out in open source is called the Fabric for Deep Learning, uh, or Fiddle. And Fabric for Deep Learning uh, came out of IBM Research in collaboration with, uh, with IBM's uh, Deep Learning as a Service product teams. Um, and Fiddle is a, a meta framework for training um, deep learning machine learning models across frameworks. So it's framework agnostic. Um, it supports TensorFlow, CAFE, PyTorch, Keras, H2O. Um, and it's built on top of Kubernetes, so it takes care of all the, uh, the typical uh, you know, issues and, and, and problems that have to be solved around managing a cluster of machines, uh, allocation to, to GPUs, uh, different configurations, different frameworks, um, settings, versions. Um, so as a data scientist, you can, you, know, you can step back from that and not worry about uh, how, how your training is going to be deployed. Uh, you simply um, submit your training code zipped up, um, point point the model or point fiddle towards um, you know, a, a data storage location, 
um, and provide a, a simple configuration manifest file. And Fiddle will take care of everything else, uh, from scaling up to, to multi, uh, multi-node, multi-GPU, um, and managing the training uh, process and, and monitoring. Um, and you don't have to worry about any of that. So Fiddle's got a, a number of community partners, um, some I mentioned here, supports uh, Uber's Horovod uh, for distributed training, PyTorch's distributed training uh, mechanisms, um, and Selden Core for model uh, deployment. So once you've uh, sort of solved some of those problems with, with training, uh, you have to move on to deploying those models. Um, so AI model deployment is all around answering the what, the where, and the how. So what are you deploying? What do we mean by a model? Uh, where are you deploying that target environment? Is it uh, real-time inference? Is it batch? Is it streaming? Um, and how are you deploying? What is the you know, serving framework, the DevOps mechanism that, you, that you're using? So today we'll mostly talk about uh, the what and you know, what is a model and a little bit about the others. So when we talk about a machine learning model, what do we actually mean? Um, so typically, model uh, means just the algorithm, you know, the, the trained uh, deep learning uh, graph or you know, logistic regression with a bunch of weights. Uh, but data does not arrive nicely packaged as vectors or tensors that are ready to be fed into that model. We have to go th- start from raw data and go through the transformation phase, extract features, pre-processing, uh, and then we can train the model um, and make predictions while we're training um, and, and do our optimization. Now at uh, deployment phase or at uh, prediction time, if we do not apply exactly the same pre-processing steps, then we're gonna get a garbage in, garbage out scenario. Uh, we're not going to, you know, and that's known as model skew, or, or training, training time, inference time skew. So really we have to uh, deploy not just the model, but the full pipeline. So that's data transformation, feature extraction, of course the machine learning model itself. Um, and something that's often overlooked is, is the transformation of the actual prediction. So most machine learning uh, models will you know, predict um, a single number or, or perhaps a, a vector or a tensor. And that's typically gonna be a regression prediction or probability, class probability prediction. Uh, and that's not often directly usable in an application, business application. So you have to then transform that into something that is more human readable or more consumable, for example, JSON uh, in a web application. And even the ETL phase is actually technically part of this pipeline. Um, and that's something that most uh, toolkits, if uh, probably all of them, uh, actually tend to ignore. But fortunately, in, in open source frameworks, you know, we have a lot of support for pipelines, scikit-learn, SparkML, TensorFlow, uh, Kubeflow pipelines more recently. Um, but we have a lot of challenges. So um, as I've alluded to before, we have to bridge all these different frameworks, uh, languages, uh, dependencies and versions, you know, performance and, um, and, uh, and features, uh, you know, and potentially you know, bugs introduced uh, across these versions and, and uh, as they evolve. Uh, we have to deal with the performance characteristics that change uh, across all of these dimensions. Uh, team friction between data scientists, researchers, production and business, uh, and a prol- proliferation of formats. Each of these frameworks has their own way of representing um, a model or a you know, serialized model or a deployed model. Uh, and m- many of these are open source. So yes, Spark, uh, Spark ML, TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, they all have their own way of doing things and you can go and dig into the code and figure out how it works. But they're not, not open standards, so you know, don't necessarily have any say into uh, how that format evolves. Um, so you can, you, can, you can look at it, but you, you cannot actually influence it. Um, so there's some, some open source, open standard uh, standards for ML deployment that I'll mention a little bit later. So for deployment, uh, containers have become popular um, for most software deployment, and uh, the same holds true of, um, of machine learning. Uh, and there's uh, the significant benefits to this, you know, repeatability, ease of configuration, probably most importantly, the separation of concerns. So data scientists can focus on what they're doing, um, and they don't really have to worry about how it's gonna get deployed. All they need to do is package up their code into a container in you know, uh, certain formats um, and throw it over the wall to production and away you go. Uh, but that's not really enough because what goes into that container is the most important thing. Um, and performance can be really variable across all these frameworks. So if you have a, uh, an R model or may, uh, maybe a plain Python uh, piece of code or model, that may not be as performant as something that's optimized um, using, using you know, NumPy or Number or, uh, or TensorFlow, for example. Uh, and you also have to have good DevOps practices. 
uh, to make sure that you've got a you know, repeatable uh, continuous integration deployment pipeline. Um, so it doesn't solve this issue of standardization, and you really need to standardize the formats and the APIs exposed uh, to get the maximum benefit and the maximum transparency. So this is something that we looked at um, within our team. Um, and about a year ago, we, we released the first version of the uh, IBM developer model Acid Exchange, and the link is there. So this is a, it's almost a model zoo of model zoos, or probably, probably better yet, a, a library of model zoos, uh, where we are curating free and open source deep learning models across a, across a wide variety of domains, uh, including uh, image recognition, natural language processing, uh, video, speech, uh, and it's framework agnostic, uh, typically mostly TensorFlow PyTorch, but there's, there's others floating around. We, we just released our first Onyx model. Um, and we go and vet and test the code and, and importantly, the intellectual property um, associated to these models. So it's all very well uh, that there are models out there floating around, coming out of research labs, coming out of you know, companies, coming out of uh, academia, coming out of just, just this, you know, random GitHub repository. But how do you know that that code, number one, does what it says uh, it does, uh, that it's performant, um, and that you can actually use it, right? There's risk involved in, in taking code uh, and pre-trained models and, and looking at data sets, and there's, there's a lot of legal uh, legalities involved. So we go and you know, vet and check the IP associated with the pre-trained model weights, uh, with the code, uh, do the testing, and wrap it up in a standardized um, uh, format using a, a kind of lightweight framework. So this means that uh, we, the deployable models on Max, you can deploy as Docker containers within a few seconds. They will expose uh, Swagger-based APIs uh, in a standardized way. Um, and for, for models that are trainable, you can get going with Fiddle, as I mentioned earlier, Fabric for Deep Learning, uh, or on your local machine, or on IBM's Watson Machine Learning uh, Cloud Service uh, within a few minutes, all using a standardized, uh, you know, a standardized approach and standardized script. So one of the things that we uh, have tried to, to, to start doing with Max, and, and, and this is a, you know, an ongoing uh, kind of project, um, is this idea of you know, being more transparent um, and, and more clear and open with what a model, uh, what, what, is, what is the metadata attached to a model, what it does, what is its performance. So one of, the, one of these is licensing, as I mentioned. So very quickly, you can have a look at the table and see what are the licenses attached to each component of this model and, very, and you know, make a quick uh, decision uh, about whether it's suitable for your application. Uh, all the models on Max are targeted at open source licenses, so we hope that there would be. Um, uh, likewise, with metadata, you can very quickly see where did, what was this model trained on, which data set uh, is underlying this. Um, uh, and, and we've recently started to introduce more and more benchmarking to show uh, how performant is this model on, on standardized data sets, um, and in particular, if we have you know, gone and trained a model or, or we're taking a model from somewhere else, um, verifying that, that that performance is in fact correct. Uh, so some of the things that we are, you know, uh, are starting to look at now is taking this a step further. Um, so in the case of input data, uh, is it enough to just say, well, this is the input data that a model was trained on? Do we need to be, we need to dig a little bit deeper and, and open up that transparency further and say, um, what, are the, what are the limits of the data? Where will it do well? Where can you expect it to perform? Um, and where, where can you expect uh, it to not perform as well if certain types of data are fed to it. You know, what kind of images, for example, uh, has, has it been shown? What is the range of that data? Um, and then that, that then links to, uh, to issues around you know, uh, bias and explainability. So can we, uh, can we start uh, opening up uh, you know, the, the level of bias that may be present either in the data set or in the model um, and, and start attaching you know, n uh, transparent numbers uh, to that, and so this model metadata starts growing into, uh, into almost like a fact sheet uh, that shows, uh, at a glance, uh, very easily um, all, all the pertinent information to make a decision. So I briefly mentioned uh, on the mo for model deployment some of the open standards that exist, and, and uh, we'll go through them very really quickly. Um, but essentially, why open standards? You know, what is, why is this important? Uh, you know, it solves uh, a technical challenge, some of those technical challenges that we mentioned, uh, because it, it effectively separates the concerns of the producer and the, and the consumer. So uh, if you're a, a data scientist or a researcher and you generate a model, you know, if you export it to a, a standard format, and, uh, then you don't have to worry uh, that, it's, that it's going to work as expected. Um, as long as your uh, production engineers support that, that standard format, you can happily throw it over the wall. 
um, and they can deploy it to, to their, you know, their single serving environment. Uh, so from the production side um, or the model consumer side, the same thing, they don't have to worry really where that model came from, um, but they can actually just take it and use it uh, in, their in, their, in their serving environment uh, in a standardized way. Uh, and it also means that you don't have to worry about versions, so uh, it doesn't matter wh which version of TensorFlow or Scikit-Learn or Keras that model came from. As long as it's conforming to that standard, you can deploy it as a, as a production engineer. And you only have to worry about one system, so you don't have to go and support um, you know, a, a whole different uh, range of uh, frameworks and versions and Docker containers. Uh, you only have to have one uh, serving system or one serving engine that can then handle all of those models. Um, I'm not, so the, uh, one of the other um, uh, challenges that open standards help solve is that, um, first of all, even though some of the formats are open source, as I said, they're not open standard, so you don't have any control necessarily um, about how they evolve. And if they're owned by effectively one company, um, or you know, one or two, kind of oligopoly, uh, then that could go in a direction that doesn't suit you. So an open standard is, is you know, governed by committee, um, and there's some downsides to that. You know, the, it may move more slowly, but as a result, um, you know, it, it, the decisions are going to be made in a, in a transparent and open manner. Um, and, if you have an, uh, and if you have an open standard format, uh, then it, that allows you to, uh, to create you know, standardized tools for, for, for example, uh, evaluating bias, evaluating explainability. Um, so instead of having to do that for each and every uh, different framework, you can do it once. Okay, so I'll, I'll very briefly mention uh, three of them. Uh, the first is predictive model markup language, or PMML, uh, which is created by the data mining group um, it's a fairly old standard now, but probably the, the most widely used. Um, and that's uh, an XML-based uh, standard that uh, supports a wide variety of machine learning models and transformations. Uh, good support for your typical um, uh, toolkits that are used out there, like so learn R, XGBoost, LightGBM, SparkML. Uh, but the downside of this is that it doesn't, uh, you know, anything that doesn't fall into the standard is not supported. So uh, it's very difficult um, to represent arbitrary kind of functions or transforms. Um, and what you end up having to do is, uh, is to have custom plugins or extensions. And the minute you do that, you lose the benefits of a standard. Uh, so to address that, uh, the DMG came up with the portable format for analytics, or PFA. Um, and this is kind of, you can sort of think of it as PMML++ uh, or version two. Uh, so it's, it's JSON-based instead of XML. Um, and what it tries to do is act as a mini functional math language with a schema specification. So it's a lot more flexibility. Uh, flexible, and it allows you to, um, to represent just about any analytic transform. Uh, but still, it's a, you know, the shortcomings are, it's a young standard, still has to gain adoption. Um, the production readiness and robustness and performance, especially at scale, is an open question. And there's some definite issues there at the moment. Um, and there's some limitations at the moment. For example, it doesn't uh, support you know, the uh, deep learning applications in the sense that it doesn't have tense operations and, and, uh, and native tensor types uh, and the kind, of, um, uh, the kind of operators that you need for convolutions and so on for, uh, for deep learning. Uh, and the final one is Onyx or the Open Neural Network Exchange. Uh, so that was recently championed by Facebook and Microsoft. Um, and much like, uh, like PFA does for, for traditional machine learning, Onyx uh, you know, is, is this uh, fully encapsulated format where the, uh, the format itself uh, holds the serialized computation graph uh, as well as the, the model weights. So you have one kind of file, or one protocol buffer um, that specifies everything. So it's more focused on deep learning, um, but, the, but recently there's the OnXML um, you know, piece of the core spec which covers traditional machine learning operators, trees, transformations. Um, there's still a few missing pieces, for example, string categorical processing, you know, other, other kind of variables and, uh, and data types like date times and collection operators. Um, and it's an evolving standard. It's difficult to keep up with the pace of development of these deep learning frameworks. So you know, coverage can be, uh, can be lacking at the moment, for example, for TensorFlow. Um, it's always a work in progress. Um, and likewise, you know, keeping up with, with PyTorch and Keras and so on. Okay, so once we've uh, gone through the training and deployment and you have a, a model that's live, uh, the next thing you have to worry about is monitoring and feedback. Um, and monitoring has three components. 
software performance and business. So part of it is uh, traditional software monitoring, the kind of things that you'd always do, um, you know, latency throughput, your re resource utilization. Um, and the, the second is um, specific to machine learning, and that's model metrics. Uh, so this includes traditional ML evaluation metrics. You know, if you've uh, deployed a classifier, you want to know what is the uh, AUC over time, um, you know, how is it performing from a, from a accuracy or prediction perspective. Um, but increasingly, we always need, also need to worry about um, continually monitoring the bias, robustness, you know, explainability metrics around that model. Um, and the final thing is the business uh, metrics. So the, what, are the impact, uh, what is the impact of that model on your business? Uh, and you know, uh, this is ultimately the most important for, for the real life uh, applications. You know, if, you've, uh, if you've deployed a recommender, what is the uplift in, in revenue, uh, fraud detection model, you know, what are your cost savings, uh, or how much fraud have you actually prevented? Um, what is your user engagement if it's a user facing application? Uh, and the second component is feedback. So once a model is deployed, it is, uh, it's acting on a, a real-time stream of data coming in. Um, and more and more, this is actually involving uh, user-facing applications. So the model itself is interacting with users, for example, um, chatbots, uh, you know, recommendation engines. So you have this, uh, th this, this issue of feedback where the model itself can, can impact its future training data. So uh, recommenders are a good example. Um, as you make predictions, you're getting it, you can, you've got this risk of running into this, uh, this feedback loop, uh, the echo chamber effectively. Um, and that can lead to you know, a wide variety of, of issues like we've seen in, uh, in, in news and fake news um, and, uh, and extreme you know, YouTube recommendations. And it's very easy to quickly get into, into the silo where you know, you're not seeing a fair representation um, and the model is kind of feeding off of itself. So this is something that has to be taken into account. Okay, so we've, we talked through all the kind of uh, typical steps uh, of that workflow. Um, but as mentioned right at the beginning, you know, th those are fairly standard things. Um, but increasingly, we need to worry about um, you know, trust in this AI, uh, transparency, fairness, security. Uh, so recently, you know, bias in AI um, and explainability have become uh, be become critical. Um, and there've been bias issues highlighted in solutions from facial recognition, um, you know, hiring, criminal justice, online advertising, and more. Um, you know, in facial recognition, certain uh, certain genders or certain racial groups may have uh, different, typically much lower accuracy versus versus others. Uh, these are some examples that have become you know really prevalent and, and talked about. Uh, so we often think about bias in AI as, as related to these sensitive uh, you know, variables, um, but it also actually applies to, uh, to any feature, really. So we can think about bias as, you know, in, in an image recognition application, um, as referring to the, the different lighting uh, conditions or the different camera angles or the, the, you know, the, the, the lens uh, aperture or the, the distance from the camera. These are all um, actually uh, you know, features or variables that, that can change, and the model, um, if it's only shown certain, uh, certain types of data with certain variables, um, whether it's you know, gender or, or, or racial variables, or whether it's you know, lighting conditions, the, then naturally there's gonna be a bias in that data set. So we have to think about this a little bit more holistically. Um, you know, of course, the, 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 the bias to sensitive variables is important, um, probably the most important, um, but it's worth noting that, that this applies to, to all kind of variables. Um, and it applies to variables that are present and also not present in the data. So uh, often uh, sensitive variables may not even be present as inputs, uh, but the model is still learning. Uh, you know, the whole point of a machine learning model is it can learn uh, from variables that are not there. It can, it can extract correlations and causations and, and interconnections um, that are hidden. So because it's very good at doing that, uh, it can actually uh, it can it can uncover bias in the underlying data sets um, that are that have nothing to do with whether sensitive variables are present or not. You know, recently there's been uh, issues around hiring models um, that are essentially picking out the bias in the hiring managers um, underlying that, even though there's no uh, you know, ex explicit sensitive sensitive variables uh, that are fed into that model. So the issue here is that uh, really. 
a single amalgamated view of accuracy and performance is just not enough. We have to really drill down into different populations and we need a way to, uh, to measure and mitigate these, uh, these issues. So one such way is, a, is a, another project that came out of IBM Research uh, that Coday uh, is, is working with in, in the community, and that's the AI Fairness 360 Toolkit. So it's an open source library from uh, IBM Research um, that focuses on bias detection and mitigation um, and, and uh, fairness metric explanation. So there's, uh, there's over 30 fairness metrics um, and uh, around 10 mitigation algorithms for bias. Uh, so it's available on GitHub, uh, there's also a, uh, a developer.ibm.com uh, code pattern which, uh, which walks you through how to actually use this toolkit uh, in, a, in a loan processing application, so an end-to-end -end use case. Um, and they've got a really, uh, really great demo page which I encourage you to go and check out. Um, the link is up there. Uh, and there you can, you can play around with some standard data sets, uh, go through the bias check to see which, uh, which variables are impacted, um, and then choose a, 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 mitigant, um, a mitigation technique um, in some cases, it's, it's, it's dealing with, uh, with it at the data phase, so you know, resampling or reweighting. In some cases, it's dealing with it at the modeling phase, so an, al an algorithmic technique. Um, and you can play around with all of those and see what the impact is and see how, um, how certain sensitive variables are, are, you know, are mitigated from an, an unfair range, um, and the result is, is it now a fair range. Um, so you know, your, accuracy may, your overall accuracy may be, uh, may be negatively impacted, but of course, uh, you now have a model that is actually uh, fair. Uh, so the final thing I'll talk about quickly is, uh, is defending machine learning systems um, and this concept of security. So uh, as, they, as these uh, AI and machine learning systems are uh, applied to more and more life critical applications, we have to really uh, be concerned about this. It's not just a theoretical um, aspect. So an adversarial attack, uh, is typically associated with image recognition, but you know, more recently there's been, uh, been work involving uh, text, uh, but we'll talk about mostly images. Uh, and that's where with relatively small uh, perturbations in the input image, you can completely destroy effectively the model's prediction. Uh, so on the left is a classic example of applying a tiny amount of uh, noise, uh, which to the human eye is imperceptible, uh, but you're completely changing the prediction. Um, so, you know, whether you predict panda or gibbon may not be very, uh, you know, a very bad thing for, for an application. Um, but on the right, we can see that actually by uh, taking a stop sign and adding some perturbation, you can make the machine learning model think that that is a speed limit sign um, at 45 or 60 miles per hour. Yeah, so that's a different story, right? Um, that that's, has severe implications. So again, we need a way to, uh, to measure uh, the robustness. Uh, to defend against attack. Uh, and one such way that, that uh, we work on in Coday is the Adversarial Robustness Toolbox. Um, again, it's a project that comes out of IBM Research um, that was released as, as open source, available on GitHub. Um, and it, it has a, a, a range of uh, attacks that you can actually test out on your model um, to see what is, the, uh, what, is the, what is the impact and what is the robustness of the model that you've trained. A variety of defense mechanisms for common attacks uh, detection methods um, and, and metrics that you can that you can apply, uh, and again, there's a IBM developer code pattern that walks you through how to integrate uh, that uh, art um, attack and defense into a, a training pipeline using Fiddle. Um, so, for example, one of the uh, one of the metrics that is available is Clever or the Cross Lipschitz Extreme Value for Network Robustness metric. Uh, that was published by IBM Research, and it's an attack agnostic measure. So it, it, it's a measure that tries to measure the overall robustness of a, of a deep learning model. Um, and it can be you know, computed efficiently even for extremely large networks like ResNet and so on. Um, so there's a, a, a few resources if you want to go and find out more about this, but this is one example of what, uh, what ART um, provides you, so uh, mechanisms for measuring uh, the robustness. Uh, so these bias uh, metrics and, and, uh, and robustness metrics uh, can then be added to the set of metrics that you, that you, that you typically uh, evaluate your models on. So it's no longer enough to, uh, you know, to just evaluate based on accuracy. We need to take uh, these other metrics into account. Uh, so Art also has a really interesting demo, which I uh, encourage you to go check out. 
Uh, so you can start out with you know, uh, some of the stock standard uh, images, and we can see that, you know, that that does a pretty good job of, of predicting a Siamese cat. Um, you can uh, apply a, a certain attack to that um, at, a, at a certain strength, and we can see that now the model thinks that that is an ambulance. Uh, but to the human eye, of course, uh, we can't tell the difference. Um, and then you can uh, you know, apply uh, various, various defenses and even stacking them on top of each other. Um, and and you, can, you can start to play around with all of those and the strengths of them to see what is the impact on, on, uh, on getting the correct result, but also what is the trade-off in terms of accuracy. So in some cases, you might get the correct result, but your accuracy of that prediction comes down significantly. Okay, uh, so we've been through you know, quite a whirlwind of, uh, of the different phases of machine learning and the projects. Um, so I just want to kind of summarize what we do in Code A, which is the end-to-end -end enterprise AI lifecycle in open source across the Python data science stack, um, and including these, these, uh, these projects that I mentioned, Fiddle, Max, AI, Fairness 360, and the open, uh, Art and the Open Standards. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not enough anymore to just um, use all of these toolkits to do your training and your, your, your evaluation, your prediction. Uh, we need to really uh, start applying some of these robustness techniques, bias mitigation techniques, explainability, um, and open standards uh, to our machine learning models to make them trusted, you know, open, secure, fair, and transparent. Well, thank you very much. If you want to know more, please check out codea.org. Uh, developer.ibm.com, and you can reach me on Twitter and GitHub at MLNick. Thank you. Thank you.